Hey guys and welcome back to a new video. In this video I will talk about Gradle because so many of you actually wanted me to do a video about that and I'll not only make one video I'll make two videos about Gradle. So this is the first kind of part of that two video playlist you can say in which I will talk about the basics of Gradle in the context of Android and in the next video we will then do a little bit more advanced stuff like we'll build a custom Gradle task and stuff like that. So definitely watch both of these because it's quite important to know Gradle as an Android developer because you will just face it in your everyday life. So without further ado, let's actually first talk about what the heck is actually Gradle. I'm here in a very empty Android Studio project and I'm sure you faced Gradle in the past. Many have, don't have too good thoughts about Gradle because it takes endlessly to build and let's try to understand why that's actually the case and what it actually does. What is the, the actual task of Gradle? So here, every Android Studio project has a Gradle scripts folder, at least in the Android view. Um, and here we have two, kind of mo two, two kinds of Gradle files that we will use the most often. We have more Gradle files, as you can see here, Gradle wrapper properties, settings Gradle, but those two are actually the most important and most interesting ones for us Android developers. Starting with this one, build.gradle project. So we have a build.gradle project file usually and a build.gradle uh, module app gradle file. We can have more of these if we have more modules, but that's quite advanced. That's something I don't cover here. For that, I have a multi-module course, which I will link down below if you want to learn that. Um, but here I will, I will leave it at these two gradle files. So the project level Gradle file, as you can see, it just contains some kind of configuration about our project. For example, the Compose version we're going to use for our whole project, it contains some plugins like application, uh, library, the Kotlin plugin, so that we can just use Kotlin as a language in Android. And to this I will get later. And if we open the other build.gradle file, the module app one, it's a little bit larger. Uh, here you can see we have an Android block in which we just define Android specific configuration. So configuration specific to, to our app here. For example, the compile SDK, so just the SDK version our app compiles to. We define our package name and all that stuff. It's pretty self-explanatory, at least most of the fields here. So in the end, Gradle is a so-called build automator. What that means is it takes all your project configuration that we define in these Gradle files and executes different tasks in the right order to put everything together to an executable app. While a common misconception is that uh, Gradle actually compiles your project, that's not true. However, for example, Gradle makes use of the compiler, but it also makes use of other tools. For example, tools that package your, your um, resources together that you have in your RAS package. So in the end, it just takes all these different little programs to put everything together to an APK file that you can actually install and use on your um, Android device. And in the end, we have two different versions or two different types of Gradle. What we have here in Android right now is called Gradle Groovy. And then we also have a different version, which is the Gradle Kotlin version. So we can use Gradle with Kotlin together so that we define our Gradle scripts with the Kotlin language, or at least with very similar features as we have in Kotlin. Like, I mean, it is Kotlin, but it, uh, it will look a little bit different than just a plain Kotlin class. However, um, the migration from Groovy to Kotlin is a little bit painful. I show that in my multi-module course, again, which I link down below if you want to learn that. Um, if you migrate it successfully, then I think, in my opinion, the Kotlin version is actually a lot more convenient because it's strictly typed. But this Groovy version that we have here is dynamically typed, so that means um, we could assign anything here to this Compose version. It doesn't expect uh, a string. However, with the Kotlin version, we have strict typing, so it will give us an error if we don't, uh, if we pass something that's not a string for the version, and that just allows extra features like auto completion or better auto completion here in these scripts. Um, it allows things like better refactoring support in these Gradle scripts. So if you if you have the time, if you like to migrate, it pays off in the long run. Um, but here for the sake of this. Rather beginner tutorial, I will keep it at Gradle Groovy, especially because Android Studio just creates these um, by default. I'm still waiting for the day that Android Studio creates Gradle Kotlin files out of the box. Sadly, that's not the case yet. Like if you create an IntelliJ project that's not an Android project, 
that already happens, like for example for Ktor or so, but for Android sadly not, but it's not a big deal. We're totally fine using Gradle Groovy here. So the next concept, the next important concept of Gradle is the so-called Gradle wrapper. What's the Gradle wrapper? If we actually take a look here in our project view, you will notice that every Android project has this Gradle W file here. That is a binary file, um, executable, and the W stands for wrapper. So that's the Gradle wrapper, and it's kind of a script that um, makes sure that it installs a specific version of Gradle that you specify, and then actually run specific tasks. So everything Gradle can really do is considered a task. For example, if we go here to build, and we click rebuild project, then what that would do is it would run a Gradle task and Gradle will now run specific commands in a specific order to rebuild your project. And we cannot only do this here um, via the toolbar in Android Studio, but we can also execute these tasks on our own in our terminal. So if we open the terminal here, then we can say, okay, we want to use the Gradle wrapper and we want to build our project. And if we press enter, and you can see now Gradle will actually actually execute that build task. And yeah, you can see what it actually does here. It compiles the Kotlin code, builds some DEX files, packages, a lot of stuff that's happening here just to build our project. But that's the, the actual responsibility of Gradle to take all these tasks and execute this here to have this concept of building it. Uh, that this concept of building that we can use so we don't need to execute all these tasks on our own. And if we actually type Gradle W tasks here, then it will actually list all the tasks we can currently execute here with Gradle. And you can see those are actually a ton. So here we just have verification tasks. You can run the linting tool or so. Um, you can inst uh, have install tasks. And the cool thing is you can build your very own tasks. And that is what we'll actually do in the next video. So I will show you how you can create a custom Gradle task to automate something that might be of use for you and your specific Android project. Um, so it, it's really helpful to do that and to know how to actually do that. You can also see we have a signing report. So Gradle is also responsible for actually signing your app in case you want to upload that to Google Play. Um, so a lot of different tasks we have here. And for example, this clean task, you can see it deletes the build directory. And that's actually a task that was um, defined here in our project in the build.gradle project file. So if we go back to the Android view and open this, you can see that is this clean task I actually talked about. So that's how we define a task. Um, you don't need to understand the details here, but in the end, it's just a task. It's called clean. And what it does is it deletes our root project that build directory. So it goes to our root project directory to the build directory and it deletes that. So the clean task just deletes your build directory. And after that, Gradle would execute your build, um, your build task to just build your project and have that build directory again. So clean plus build would together be a rebuild. Cool. So now that this is clear, let's get to the next concept. And that is something we will apply in the build.gradle app file. And that's called build types. You can see we have a build types block here in our build.gradle app file. And right now there's only a release block. So what the heck does that mean? What is a build type? A build type kind of um, specifies at which stage, at, at which kind of a, yeah, stage in your in the whole app development lifecycle your app actually is. So you, I'm sure you know concepts like an alpha build, and a beta build, a production build, a debug build. That is what the build type would actually represent here. And for all these different stages you have in your app, you can define a build type inside of this block. By default, there's only a debug build and a release build. The debug build just um, contains some debug specific configuration so that it that it allows your debug app, your debug APK to be debuggable, which we of course want. However, for the release build that we actually sent to Google Play, we don't want it to be debuggable because that would be a security issue. And also what's uh, very common for the release build is that we use ProGuard. So ProGuard or R8 is used to actually shrink your app, to optimize your code, to obfuscate it, to make it harder to reverse engineer. And that is something we of course don't want for the debug build, but for the release one that we actually publish, 
that's uh, very common that we do this. So you should actually do this for every app. And with these build types, we can just define the specific configuration for specific build types. So if we want to enable our aid for to, to minify and shrink our app, we just set this property to true here. And then just for the release build, Gradle will actually do that. However, we can of course also define our very own build types here. So if your app, for example, has a beta build, a beta stage, then you can just go in here and have that oops, as a separate block of code. And you can now define your very own set of configuration here again, just for the beta build. So you could say, okay, I actually want this um, debugger build. I think it's called like that. I'm not sure. Um, but you can set debugger build to true, for example, to make sure that your beta build can be debugged. Or you could say, okay, I actually don't want to use progot here to um, for the beta build because you, it might not be it might only be used internally in your company or so I don't know whatever you like you can now configure here you can also use application ID suffixes so you could say dot beta and then just for the beta build it will append dot beta to your actual package name so if we have multiple apps installed on a single device then that's one way to distinguish them and if we now click synchronize now, so Gradle will actually apply all these changes we made here and go to build, select build variant. What that is, I will get to that uh, later in this video and click on that. Then you can see um, here we have an active build variant. So right now, if we would launch our app, it would take the debug build with a debug specific configuration. So we don't have a block here for that, but there is a debug build variant. If we click on that, we cannot choose between release and beta as well. So if we want to actually build our release app, we could simply select that. And now Gradle would actually create the release build with um, minifying everything with applying ProGuard and R8. And that is how you actually switch between these variants. You can't run this now on an emulator because it needs to be signed. So you need a key store and you need to provide the password to Gradle. But if you provide all that, Gradle would be able to actually run the release build directly on a device. So you might now already think you know what a build variant is. It's either beta, debug or release or whatever we add here. And that's partly true, but there's more to it. And before you understand that, we need to get to another concept and that's called a product flavor. A product flavor is, it's similar to a build type. Um, so it defines different versions, different types of your app. But the difference to a build type is that it actually affects your actual users. So while the build type actually more describes the current stage of your application, whether it's an alpha, beta, production or whatever, the product flavors are different types in the sense, for example, if you have a free and a paid version of your app, or if specific, um, if specific versions of your app need different minimum SDKs, then you can define that with so-called product flavors. And for that, we also want to go here. So that's not a default setting. We need to write that on our own. We first of all need to specify something called a um, flavor dimensions list. And here we basically define the types of product flavors we have. So let's say we want to distinguish between a free and a paid version for this specific app then that would be, for example, the paid state or paid mode, whatever you want to use for that. So that paid mode would be the dimension. That is what Gradle uses to determine which product flavors belong together. And then what we can do is we can say product flavors, open the block here. And in that block, we define our different flavors. So we might have a free version and we might have a paid version. And for the free version, and actually for both, we now need to tell Gradle to which dimension these belong. Right now, we only have this paid mode dimension. So we say, okay, the dimension is paid mode. Copy this, paste it here. So that way Gradle knows that these actually belong together because they belong to the same dimension. And now we can again define specific configuration um, just for the free version or just for the paid version. So we could, for example, say, the application ID suffix for the free version is dot free. And we could do the same for the paid version dot paid. So that way just the package name would differ a little bit for the free and paid version. But you can of course 
um, change a lot more specific configuration for these different types. So in the end, you can override all these settings you have in the default config for specific product flavors of your app. So you could also change the minimum SDK, for example. But before I show you that, let's actually click synchronize now. And now go to build and select build variant again, because then you will notice something. Now the active build variant isn't debug anymore. It's actually free debug, free beta, free release. So now we have six different build variants. And that's in the end what a build variant is. So it's a combination between a build type and a product flavor. So what Gradle will now do is it will take every single build type and kind of perform the cross product with every single product flavor we have here. So we of course want to have the option to just build the free debug build. So the debug build of the app that is free, that doesn't cost anything. Or we have the paid release build that might be the release build we actually send to Google Play to sell it. Or the paid debug build that might be the build that includes the paid features, but we just want to test it. We just want to debug it. So for every single combination, we now have a build variant. And yeah, that's what a build variant in the end is. But as I said, I want to show you something with the minimum SDK here, which is 21 for a whole app. However, what is also very common is that you define product flavors with different minimum SDKs. So let's say you have an app that has a very cool feature. However, that feature is only available from Android minimum SDK 30 onward. So from Android um, 11, I think it is, 10, 11, I think it's 11. And of course, you don't want to set the minimum SDK of your app to 30 then, because then your app can only be used for devices running on Android 11. But you also don't want to miss that cool feature, which is available for these newer devices. So what you can do is you can define a product flavor for minimum SDK 30, where you say, okay, that's actually a different dimension. Let's say that's the minimum, minimum SDK dimension, which we need to define here in this list, just by appending another entry. And for this minimum SDK 30 product flavor, we simply override the setting with 30. And then we also have another product flavor, which is minimum SDK 21, for the same dimension and we set minimum SDK to 21 here. So then we can still have our app available for older devices, but they just don't have that cool fancy feature which is available for minimum SDK 30 and onwards. And if we now click synchronize now, then something cool will happen if we take a look at our active build variant. Now you can see we have even more. So now of course it also takes combinations of for example, the release build for the free app with the minimum SDK 30 or the release build for the paid app with the minimum SDK 21. So it now will again calculate all the different combinations and create a build variant for each of these. And you can also make use of these now. For example, if we scroll down to the dependencies, which most of you will probably know here from Gradle, and you, you can see you have implementation, blah, 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 test implementation, Android test implementation, debug implementation. That might already sound a little bit like uh, what I want to show you here. So you can define or include specific dependencies only for very specific build variants. So this dependency is only included for the debug build, which is UI tooling. So which is, I think, which includes the preview stuff for Compose. So of course, you're not interested in that for the release build. So you only include it for the debug implementation. And you can do the same for your very uncreated build variants. So if we take this free minimum SDK 21 debug, we can actually say free minimum SDK 21 debug implementation. <laughs> and then we can just define a dependency that's, that only works for this specific build variant. That is pretty cool. And having that knowledge, let's get to the very last concept of this video that I want to show you, which is a very important one. And that's the concept of so-called source sets. What's a source set? If we take a look in our Java folder here, then we have three so-called source sets here. So this com directory would be one, the Android test directory and the test one. So each source set is basically a source for specific classes for specific resources. Um, so if we take a look in this one, this is the so-called main source set. It contains our main activity. And the main source set is the one that's shared 
between all other source sets. So that means from Android test and test, which contains our actual like instrumented tests and local unit tests, from both of these, we can actually access classes that are in the main source set. However, not the other way around. So we can't access our test dependencies and test classes from within our main activity, because that's what we really don't want, since that would mean our Android tests and our tests would actually be packaged into our APK. And that's really not necessary because the tests are just for us developers and not for the actual end user. However, now that we have our different product flavors or different build types, we can define more of these source sets by simply going to the app directory, right click new and directory. And here Android Studio will assist us a little bit with what we want to create. For example, if we want to create a source set, so if we want to have some classes that are only available for the debug build, then we might have a debug source set. And if we scroll down a little bit, um, for example, here, source debug Java. This is the one we're interested in. Clicking enter here. And yeah, it, it doesn't show up here because it's the Android view. If we actually go to the project view, it should show up in source. You can see now there is a debug package. If we open that, we have a Java package. And in here we can now create, or we can, we can put classes that are only available for the debug build. And that's uh, a typical use case for that would be if you have some kind of um, feature flags or so, or if you want to manipulate how your app actually, um, what happens in your app. For example, you want to you have some toggles to enable, like if you want to talk to a different server, not to the production one or so. That, that's a typical use case to put in just in the debug build. So you would have just a fragment or so that is a different version of your actual production level fragment that contains some extra toggles. So your users or your, your testers can actually um, test your app in a, in, a, in a better way. So then in here you would simply create your package structure again, compile coding dot Gradle experiment it is. And in that you could then create any, any type of Kotlin class that only applies for your debug build and is not shared between other build variants. So let's just create a class. So something is in there, um, demo class, whatever, <laughs> um, doesn't matter. And if we then collapse this, we could also say, okay, if we actually want to test this demo class, that's of course a class that's now not included in our main source set. So this demo class can't be accessed from our test source set. So what we could do is we could create another source set going to directory and say, actually, we want to have a debug test one, um, or is it called test debug? Yeah, that way. Um, so let's search for that. Where is test debug? Here we have test debug. And here we would then have our package structure again, compile coding, Gradle experiment. And here we would have our test class for demo class. So demo class test, which would then be able to actually access our demo class because it's um, the test debug directory, of course, can access our debug directory. And you also notice if we now switch back to the Android view, then yeah, all these different source sets will now show up here in a little bit more organized way. So we have uh, debug, test debug, which we added. And for every single build variant, you could now add this uh, specific source set. If you have some files, some resources that are only that only apply for a single build variant. So if this video was actually helpful and gave you a very good first understanding of what Gradle is and how we can use it for Android projects, then definitely let me know that below. Or if there's anything you did not understand, you can also ask if there's anything I can improve on. Please let me know below. And once the next video is online about building custom Gradle tasks, which is also very exciting and you should not skip that, then it will be available right here. Enjoy your day.